Hello everyone, my name is Deepa Rajan and I am a freshman here at Vanderbilt and I'm here today to talk about music therapy and Alzheimer's disease. Now before I launch into the body of my talk, I want all of you to conjure up an image in your mind. I want you to think of someone you love very much. It can be your father, your mother, a boyfriend, girlfriend, and I want you to look into their eyes and hear them say, I don't remember your name. Who are you? Heartbreaking, right? This is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in America. And among the top 10 diseases for death in America, this is the only one that cannot be slowed. It is excruciating, painful, fatal, and above all, humiliating. Many of you might have watched the recent Oscar-nominated film, Still Alice. In this movie, Alice, the protagonist, is diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. And she poignantly remarks, I wish I had cancer. Because when you have cancer, people wear ribbons for you. People run marathons for you to raise money. It's almost celebrated when you have cancer. But Alzheimer's, no, people don't wear ribbons for Alzheimer's disease. Because where do Alzheimer's patients end up? Decrepit nursing homes. And people don't visit them. I'm here to change that. Even though the beginning of this talk has been quite dismal, I'm not here to dash your hopes. I'm here to provide hope because there are treatments available and they're very promising. And one of those treatments is music therapy. And I know that it works. So to discuss the relationship between music therapy and Alzheimer's disease, first I'm gonna define what these terms are. And then I'm gonna delve into a study that I conducted to examine the relationship between music and cognition. And lastly, I will discuss a nonprofit that I founded called Harmonies for the Elderly. This is how I got introduced to this field and this is how I hope to introduce you to this field. So first of all, let's talk about what Alzheimer's is. Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disorder. This means that the brain basically dies. We currently don't know the cause of this disease, but we do know that in Alzheimer's brains, there, are, there is a buildup of amyloid beta protein and tau protein. And these proteins cause plaques and tangles that interfere with the neuronal conne connections in the brain. And actually, these proteins are quite normal. They're in all of you right now. But problems arise when they build up into excess amounts. Neurons work by sending electrical impulses across synapses. But once these synapses are clogged with this excess protein, amyloid beta and tau, the neurons can't really communicate with each other. Now let's go up a level. Let's not talk about neurons, let's talk about the brain. The brain, you've all seen those diagrams of white squiggly things. Those are neurons and glia. Glia are protective cells that surround the neurons to myelinate them and make the, connect, make the action potentials, the electrical impulses, move more quickly. Now what you might not know is in between this white matter that you see on those diagrams is, are something called ventricles. Ventricles are empty spaces within the brain. In an Alzheimer's patient, these ventricles are huge. So basically they have huge holes in their brain. And because of this, the hippocampal volume decreases. The hippocampus is an area of the brain that controls memory and is involved with the limbic system with, which controls emotion. So without your hippocampus, you are not you. You're a different person. So with Alzheimer's disease, we have the chicken and the egg question. We don't know if this decrease in hippocampal volume and the buildup of 
plaques and tangles. We don't know if this is the cause of Alzheimer's disease or just a symptom because we can only examine the brains of deceased Alzheimer's patients. But this is the these are the characteristics of the disease and we have to move forward to eliminating these symptoms. So now music therapy. What is music therapy? Well, the name is quite self-explanatory. Music therapy is using music to improve human health. Now let me tell you, scientists are very scared of music therapy. Not because it's dangerous, but because they categorize it with astrology and alchemy. It's not a pseudoscience. Music therapy is real, and you'll see why when I finish this talk. There are two different types of music therapy. One is active, and the other is receptive. Active music therapy involves audience participation. The audience will sing, clap, dance. The audience is making music. There is no stage separating the performer and the audience because everyone is a performer, everyone is a musician. Receptive music therapy is quite the opposite. It's more of a passive, meditative, relaxing process. If any of you have done guided meditation, this is similar to what receptive music therapy is. And now each of these therapies has their benefits and drawbacks. With active music therapy, it promotes high energy levels, excitement, vitality, attention, and this can be crucial for an Alzheimer's patient steeped in lethargy. But it can also promote agitation. And for someone who doesn't know where he is, agitation could mean running out of a nursing home into the street. And I've seen this. Receptive music therapy, of course, promotes relaxation, calm, uh, soothes this agitation or confusion they might feel, but it also has a sedative quality. And they spend most of their days sleeping anyway, so we want to improve their state of being, not perpetuate it. So I think establishing these definitions is important because it provides context for a deeper, more, a deeper discussion of the relationship between music and the brain. Now you're probably wondering, as am I, what is this relationship? What is the relationship between music and cognition? And I first asked this question when I went to a nursing home to play music for the first time. I was in middle school and I did this as part of a school project. I went with my friends to play a few songs for some elderly folks. We didn't know what we were doing. We played Taylor Swift and Coldplay. And we got polite nods, golf claps. No one really cared about Taylor Swift's love story. But when we played Edelweiss from The Sound of Music, people started crying. And more importantly, people started remembering. One man was standing next to his daughter, except he didn't know it was his daughter. He was very reclusive, reticent, didn't speak a word, immobile. But after we played Edelweiss, he turned to his daughter, and instead of saying, who are you? He said, I love you. So in that moment, I asked my question, what changed? What caused him to remember his daughter, not only remember her, but to love her? So like any of you, I turned to Google. I typed in, what is the relationship between music therapy and the cognition of Alzheimer's patients? And I was shocked when I didn't find anything relevant. There were papers about music therapy and the mobility of Parkinson's patients, music therapy and the cognition of autistic children, music therapy and the emotions of Alzheimer's patients, but no, no one had written about music therapy and the cognition of Alzheimer's patients. So that's what I set out to do. And actually, planning out and setting up the study was 
the most difficult part. It took me two years to find this participant group of mild to moderately diseased Alzheimer's patients and to get permission forms and fill out the paperwork. I was 15 at the time and people were reluctant to hand over their aging, dying parents to a 15-year-old kid. And I understand that. So it took me two long years to get this study set up, but I did it. And eventually I had a 10 week block of time in which I conducted my study. And during these 10 weeks, I had a series of music therapy sessions. I divided my participant group into three subgroups. One was active music therapy, the other was receptive music therapy, and then I had a combination group. So in the active music therapy group, uh, we played sing-alongs, call and response songs. I emptied little water bottles and filled them with beans to make shakers. You probably made these in kindergarten. And I just wanted these to be musical instruments for the audience members. And in the receptive music therapy group, I played mostly classical music, um, Bach, Mozart, classical favorites, songs without words that were supposed to encourage meditative, reflective qualities in the patients. And the combination group included elements of both of the previous groups. So it was about 50-50 in terms of song divisions in the program. So before and after each music therapy session, I administered a test called the mini mental state examination. And this is a very commonly administered test to diagnose Alzheimer's disease and to uh, measure the progression, the deterioration of cognitive function throughout this disease until death. And it's a very simple disease and it's a simple test and it's orally administered. It has questions like, where are you? What is today's date? Can you copy this sentence? Can you copy these figures? Count backwards from 100. So when I first looked at this test, I was thinking, this isn't gonna get me any data because the questions are so easy. But actually most people fail the tests. And it was another harsh reminder that Alzheimer's is really scary. So this was a short term study because it was only conducted over 10 weeks. But I found that short term was really relevant to the situation because often 10 weeks is all that an Alzheimer's patient has left if they're in their later stages. And the mini mental state examination covers all aspects of cognition. I try to measure not only memory, but also recall, attention, orientation, copying abilities, language, all sorts of things, because I wanted to look at the wide spectrum of what the brain is capable of. I was testing the hypothesis that the combination music therapy group would have the greatest improvement in cognitive abilities. And I hypothesized this because they would have the dual advantages of both types of therapy. The relaxing, focused qualities of receptive, as well as the energetic, attention-grabbing qualities of the active music therapy group. Turns out my hypothesis was incorrect, but my results were even more exciting than I expected. This graph up here shows the overall scores for the mini mental state examination over the three groups. And you can see that the active music therapy group had a really great significant increase in their scores on the mini mental state examination. So it's a little bit above 10%. Some of you might be thinking 10% is not that much. But let me tell you, to that daughter standing next to her father who finally remembered her name, that 10% means the world. And it gets better. This is another graph showing orientation. It's, uh, you can again see a very significant difference between the active and the receptive in combination groups. Recall, over a 30% increase. Language, there was a very small difference between active and combination but it showed that these therapies can be targeted. This shows a variety of cognitive tasks over the musical, the active music therapy group. And you can see that certain abilities were greatly enhanced 
If you look at the attention bar in orange, it's almost 60%. A 60% increase in attention after one music therapy session. I find that amazing. These results have profound implications. It means that our therapies can become targeted. From now on, when we give nursing home concerts, when we play music for Alzheimer's patients, we don't have to play all sorts of songs. We can focus on active music therapy. And within active music therapy, we can focus on certain aspects of cognition, such as the ones I showed on the slides. Orientation, recall, attention, so on. So now that, this, that these therapies can be targeted, that begs the question, how are we going to apply this in a setting? How are we going to get these therapies out there into nursing homes, making a difference in those people's lives? That's why I founded the nonprofit organization Harmonies for the Elderly, a nonprofit dedicated to providing music therapy services to Alzheimer's patients. I actually founded this organization before I conducted this study, but it was only after the study that I actually applied my data to my performances. This is an Austin, Texas-based organization, and we play concerts at least once a month and more on breaks and holidays. We've performed almost 100 concerts to date. We design programs that tailor to the audience's needs, so no more Taylor Swift and Coldplay. We play You Are My Sunshine, This Land Is Your Land, and more than just playing music, we engage in music therapy. We are no longer the performers, and the people sitting in front of us are no longer the audience members. We are all musicians together, because that is what active music therapy is about. They sing, they dance, they move their shakers along with us. We are performing together. So obviously, I do not live in Austin, Texas anymore. I live in Nashville, and I am currently creating a new chapter of my organization here at Vanderbilt. And this is a call to all of you musicians in the audience. If you want to change the world through music, the first step is joining this organization, because we will get music to the people who need it most. So as I conclude this talk, I want you to think back to the first thing I said the person you conjured up in your mind, the person you love but couldn't remember you. I've seen hundreds of those people. Because at every nursing home, each resident is a father, a mother, a sweetheart, someone who loved and was loved. You know, that person might even be you. Because when you're all seniors, According to the Alzheimer's Association, one in three of you will have Alzheimer's disease. These are staggering statistics. So you might be thinking, how can simple songs combat these frightening figures? Well, they can. And I don't want to end on a dismal note, so I want to provide a hopeful anecdote. During one music therapy session during my study, I encountered an elderly woman who was especially unresponsive. She would sit in a corner and refuse to sing or talk or even wave hello to the people around her. We played You Are My Sunshine, which is usually an audience favorite. It gets people up dancing and singing, but no, she didn't do any of those things. I gave her the mini mental state examination immediately after my music therapy session. She didn't answer most of the questions. So I left the room feeling discouraged. But then I looked at her test. And as I said before, one of the questions is, write a sentence. And in her scraggly, uneven handwriting, she had written, you are my sunshine. Thank you.